kind of disgusting. So far in the series, we've mostly talked about 2 op FM. How to get two operators to interact with each other, to produce predictable waveforms and filter-like responses. But this is kind of the cheat way of thinking about FM. I needed to go a bit deeper into the way that the waveforms are actually constructed so that we can start talking about stacked operators. In the first video, we saw how we could create an organ sound by changing our modulated frequencies and turning up the levels like this. So this produces a very short part of the harmonic series with peaks one, two, three, and four. Well, we can also do that using FM. So if I go back to initialize patch and then leave the algorithm on this one and then just feed operator two into operator one. Those same four peaks appear. So this means if we wanted to, we've had enough sine waves, we could stack them on top of each other and create any waveform we wanted. This is called additive synthesis. This is quite useful information because it tells us that each one of those peaks can be represented by a sine wave. This is something called the Fourier series and it's worth looking into. Any waveform can be created by an infinite number of sine waves. This is something we'll refer back to later. So if I had to describe FM in three words, it would be modulation creates sidebands. That's all we're ever doing when we're creating sounds in FM, we're just adding sidebands to the existing waveform. For a sine wave, these peaks appear both sides of a spike on the spectrogram, which may seem counterintuitive because from what we've seen so far, we can create sidebands to just appear on the right. But uh, bear with me and I'll explain. So let's take this sound. So I'm playing this G and it's about 100 hertz. So let's, for, for argument's sake, let's say it's 100 hertz. And then I'm gonna turn this up to 10, which will take it up to 10 times 100 hertz, which is 1000 hertz. If we then modulate that, we can see the sidebands appearing either side of it. So if I turn up operator two, we can see a predictable set of bands appearing either side. It's actually pretty easy to calculate by hand where these frequencies are gonna turn up. You take the carrier frequency, in this case 1000 hertz, and you minus off the modulated frequency, in this case, 100 hertz, and that gets us 900. And as we can see on the graph, we've got a peak at 900. We take 100 off again, we get 800. We've got a peak at 800, and 700, and 600, and so on. Then we do the same on the other side. We add 100, so 1,100, 1,200, 1,300, and so on. And we can see on the graph we've got those present. So that's pretty simple. As we up the modulator level, we will see things start to change. The center frequency starts to dip and we get these ripples appearing. Which cascade along. All we need to calculate those is a Bessel function. F uh, yeah, maybe avoid that. We don't really need to know the exact volume that all these frequencies are gonna be. So just experiment. Another thing you'll notice is that as we increase the modulation level, we start to perceive that note not being that high note, but being the low one, as in the modulator. And this happens even before the fundamental frequency, or the lowest that we've seen, 100 hertz, starts to appear. This is because the particular spread in spikes of the graph belong to the harmonic series related to the modulator frequency. The spikes will be further apart for high frequencies and closer together for low frequencies. The brain is very clever and it can actually determine this without all the information present. This is due to something called psychoacoustics. So if we've got a high carrier frequency and a low modulator frequency, we get predictable bounds that we can see either side on our graph. But what happens if we go back to one to one? We've got one to one here, we've got 100 hertz at the bottom, and as we raise the level, we can see bounds start to appear at 200, 300, and 400, because we've got 100 plus 100, 100 plus 200, and so on. What's happened to all the other frequencies that we talked about in the minus side? Well, if we take 100 from 100, we just get zero. So that's zero hertz. That's not, that's not oscillating at all. That's not gonna add anything to our sound. If we take 100 and minus 200, we get minus 100 hertz. So what on earth is a minus frequency? 
Well, in this case, it actually comes back reflected off zero hertz, but is upside down. So we get a peak at 100 hertz combined with an upside down version of it at minus 100 hertz. This takes away some volume from 100. But the 100 hertz peak is going to be a little bit louder, so that still survives. <laughs> And this is the same all the way up the harmonic series. So it's actually the interaction between the high parts of the spectrum and the low parts of the spectrum bouncing back up and interfering that give FM a lot of its strange resonant tone that we like so much. So what about the square wave example that we gave before? So frequencies 1 to 2. So this produces this result as we saw before. With every other harmonic missing. So because we've gone 1 to 2, we've got a carrier of 100 hertz and a modulator of 200 hertz. If we take 100 and add 200, we've got a peak at 300 that we can see. But 100 minus 200 is minus 100, which is taken away from the fundamental frequency. Adding 100 to 400 gets us a 500 peak, we can see. And 100 minus 400 gives us minus 300, so that's taken away from the 300 peak that we can see. And if we follow this along, we can see that every other harmonic is present in the resultant waveform, as we'd expect. So what if we go above 1 to 2? I've chosen 1 to 5 as an example, but basically the result is the same. The bands just get spread further and further apart. What we end up with is pairs of frequencies appearing. So what's happening here? We've got 100 plus 500, because our frequency is 5. That's producing a peak at 600. But we've also got 100 minus 500, and that's minus 400. That's reflected back up, but it doesn't interfere with anything else, so we can see it very clearly. Then the same is true as we go up. So we've got 100 plus 1,000 is 1,100. 100 minus 1,000 is minus 900, which we can also see. So for this configuration, we're always going to get pairs appearing, and they'll always have one harmonic missing in between them. So to summarize, when we've got a high carrier frequency and a low modulator, we're going to get visible sidebands either side. When our modulator and carrier matching frequency, the lower sidebands are going to be reflected up and combined with the upper sidebands. When we have a low carrier frequency and a high modulator frequency, we're going to get pairs of bands appearing. So what's any of this got to do with stacked modulators? Well, we saw in the beginning, if we use a one-to-one -one pair and a subtle bit of modulation, we can create something that's just got a few sidebands in it, or a few peaks on the spectrum. So here I've set it up so just three peaks appear. Because of what we're saying about the Fourier series at the start of the video, each of these peaks can be thought of as a sine wave. So we've essentially got three sine waves here. So by modulating this, we add sidebands to these frequencies. So essentially by turning up operator 3, we'll be modulating those three frequencies. So it works exactly the same as the examples we saw before, we can add sidebands to those three. So in this case I've got the frequency set to 10, so we've got a higher modulator, that's going to create pairs. So it's essentially going to copy those three frequencies across, and in pairs. Again, the levels of them jump around a little bit because of that scary bezel function, but yeah, the results are quite predictable. This time if we turn up operators 1 and 2 to something a bit higher so we can see, but leave operator 3 low, as we turn up the level, we'll create side bands between them. As these sidebands interact with each other, we'll get cancellation again. So it's a little bit difficult to tell how loud they're going to be, but the positions are predictable. So you might be wondering about feedback. Well, feedback is just a type of modulation in itself. It's just that the same operator is modulating itself round and round in a circle. So if we take operator 1 here and turn up its feedback level, we're going to see parts of the harmonic series appear as before. Then if we go to the frequency and turn this up to 2 and modulate it with something that's lower, that's going to produce sidebands for every peak in this spectrum. So you can just think of any waveform as a series of sine waves and each one of those gets modulated, therefore producing a sideband. 
So if we turn up operator two here, you can see sidebands will start to appear between the peaks. Again, getting more and more unpredictable as the modulation level rises. So just to go over this another way, if we're using stacked modulators, anything that's produced in the lower part of the stack, when it's modulated by an upper part of the stack, will just have more sidebands added to it. And their positions will depend on the things we've already talked about, whether they're copies above or come in between or interact with their phases. If the modulator is a high frequency, they will be copied above. If the modulator is a low frequency, they will be copied in between. And if it matches, they will just overlap and interact with their phases. Don't forget though, this also applies to non-integer ratios. So we can put things in really weird places and the sound design potential is absolutely huge. So this has been a bit academic so far. So let's just make up a quick patch. Going back to initialize patch. I'm gonna leave these two operators on one to one and I'm gonna bring up the level of operator two just to give it a bit of modulation which gives us that sound. I'm going to let uh, operators one and two fall down to zero over time. So we've got that. Let's change their rates. So I'm just going to change this to, let's say, let's try 30. Make that more or less the same. So we've got a bit of decay over time. Now I'm going to change this uh, operator three frequency to six and then bring its level up. I'm going to smash it right up to the top. Just going to add absolutely loads of harmonics in and then we can do the same thing with this. We can let this fall over time. Maybe something a little bit faster. So 45. You've got that kind of classic uh, Mega Drive y kind of sound. I'm going to detune these a little bit from each other um, just to give it a bit more movement. And then we can bring up the feedback level if we want to. Um, I don't know, let's try 30. I don't know, a bit more. So that's kind of disgusting. Um, let's try putting on mono legato. So this will not re-trigger the envelopes and it will give it a bit of a pitch glide. So that's a kind of disgusting bass sound. Uh, this is sort of very, very quick demonstration. But as you can see, when we had no modulation here, we had very few harmonics. And then when we lifted this, it basically copies all those over. And because of the extreme nature of the settings we've got, we've got those ripples appearing as well. If we start to go up the keyboard, you'll notice it sounds pretty horrible. We can rein this in, but I'll leave that for another episode because we need to look at scaling. So I hope you found this useful and it's started to explain a bit about why we stack operators to get more harmonics into our sound, brighter sounds. Um, I'll be back with another episode. I think we're going to start talking about how to control the sound a bit more. I'll talk about how we can route velocity to different operators, uh, that uh, scaling that we we're just talking about, and things like playing in an LFO just to get a bit of movement into the sound. So thank you very much for watching and I'll catch you in the next one. Cheers.